How's it going guys? Welcome back to The Underground. My name is Tim Ruswick and today we're going to dive in deep to some of the thoughts and design concepts behind a game I did for a game jam recently. The game jam was a game dev league March Madness jam and the theme was superheroes. Now when the theme got released on day one I got to thinking what really is a superhero? Is it their superpowers? Well Batman doesn't have superpowers and he's a superhero. Is it their hidden identity? I mean Superman literally just puts on glasses and calls it a day. So by not wanting to follow the trend and just randomly make a game about a stereotypical superhero, but at the same time still fit in with the theme. So what I came up with was Indy Jones, The Raiders of the Lost Art. And the concept was going to be simple. These game characters exist inside the computer of an indie developer and the computer crashes. But you find out that you have the superpower of withstanding the great crash, as they call it, and you're tasked with restoring all of the game's artifacts. See what I did there? That was just lost in the crash. You fight your way through code, semicolons, brackets, and game-breaking bugs. So here's how I started the process. I actually began with the intro. In game jams specifically, but in all games in general, the introduction experience is often the most important part of the game. Because if you think about it, most gamers don't play games all the way to the end. That makes the very first part the most played section of your entire game. And the intro was just literally some really basic shapes. It was built to look like a dude sitting around a computer typing away with a clear view of some of the game assets. I started with the computer and desk, but I left the computer monitor blank at first because I wasn't sure what the art was going to look like. I then quickly whipped up what looks like a dude's back and the hair, I have no idea, but it was quick and easy. Then I moved on to the main character. I started again with super basic shapes and I wanted him to have a distinctive look but still look super simple. Then I copied him for his bald old mentor and I literally just took the main dude and drew a cloud on his face. After that was done, I started designing the enemies. Now this is a weird process because I went through a lot of different enemy types conceptually, but I decided on a few that I thought matched the theme of this post-crash digital world. So the first enemy is literally just a semicolon. That's it. If you're a programmer, you get the joke. The second enemy was a set of brackets, not as annoying as the missing semicolon, but a big part of code for sure. The third, I could not for the life of me figure out a simple way to convey a bug, so I googled an image of a ladybug and I just modeled a basic black and white version of that. And the final boss enemy was 100% sure that it was going to be an Indiana Jones reference, and you can't really do that without a dude running from a giant boulder, so that's what the last enemy is. I just took the color and the face from the blue screen of death and I put it onto a boulder form. So at this point I felt I had plenty of assets and I needed to actually build at least the first part of the game, so that's what I did. I built out the intro scene in-engine, added the audio, and started the player out in an intro level. The goal of the intro level is to be safe with no enemies, it gives you time to learn the controls, gets used to movement and jump speeds, and it introduces you to the world and setting. The idea being that if you go to the end, you meet the mentor and he sets up the story and the objective for you. Here's what the intro looks like. Are you f***ing kidding me? Are you f***ing kidding me? All of my f***ing f***ing god f***ing art? All of it? When I finished with the intro, I started on the transition scene. There needed to be a way for the old dude to tell you stuff, but also it's a thing where you would see between levels and it would give you the objective for what you were doing next. 
What I ultimately went with was just a white background with two floating heads and two text boxes with a typewriter effect on them. It's skippable too, so if you don't want to watch it, you can just press any key to jump to the next level and keep going. It's simple, but it's pretty decent. After that, I jumped straight onto the design of the first actual level of the game. This level had to be easy, but it had to have a difficult section or two to show the player that this is a hard game. The main objective here was still to get the player used to their controls and speeds, as well as introduce them to the first enemy type, which was the semicolons. The mechanic I chose for the semicolons was just to drop off like stalactites in a cave. This seemed like the most obvious answer besides a projectile, and doing that I think would have been off theme, so I just went with this. In a platformer, the environment is just as important as the enemies too, so I took careful precaution to space out drops in the level, big structures that stop jumping, and some sneaky tactics as well. This is not a game to speedrun because I've taken some environmental precautions to stop or kill the player at certain points. Now level 2 gets significantly harder. In fact, from my analytics I see that most people quit here. I happen to like ridiculously hard rage inducing games, so this was intentional and I knew it wouldn't be for everybody, but I did it anyway. The mechanic I chose for the brackets is something I can only really identify as a jumper or a lunger. When you get within a certain range, it jumps and snaps its mouth at you quickly. Once you know how to avoid it, it's pretty easy to get around, but when you mix this guy with the semicolons, you can get some really hard and interesting moments in the game. I'm pretty happy with it, and despite the low finish rate for the level, I'm actually really happy with the design of the level. Again, it's not for everyone, and there are things specifically created to kill you when you least expect it, but all in all, I think it's a pretty good level. Level 3 is weird. The code bugs that I designed as enemies actually fly toward you and are not constrained by any of the obstacles in the game. Every second, they change their angle and fly toward you. So that creates a very unique situation because the way you play this level really determines where you actually encounter these enemies. They don't start going towards you until you start moving, but if you're a slow, cautious player, these enemies will be much harder because they make you outrun them, and if you get caught between them and other obstacles, they're very dangerous because they can hover above you. The level was designed around this aspect in mind, so it's pretty open, and the ceilings are high in most places, so you can jump over them if you need to. But this enemy made the level very difficult to test because I'm a quick player and I know where all the bad guys are. So with me running through the level, these enemies were no threat at all. But I knew that the average player would not know the obstacles coming up, so they would be slower and I placed them accordingly. So level 4, this level has all the previous level enemies, but this time you're running from the blue screen of death in boulder form. Personally, I love it because of the Indiana Jones reference, but I'm not super happy with how the gameplay turned out. I think it's actually one of the easier levels because one of the design constraints I had was the whole level had to be downhill with no obstacles or the boulder would hit them. There's not much to watch out for, you just have to run the whole time and not get stuck on anything. There are two or three places where you have to properly time your jumps, but other than that, I think it's actually pretty chill and easier than the previous two levels. But as far as theme goes, I think it's great, because it seems like a boss level of sorts, and it brings the game to a close after building up tension. You know this is the last artifact, and you know there's a boulder chasing you, so when you finish, you get the sense of accomplishment. So I finally had all of the levels finished, but except for the intro sequence, the whole game still had no audio and sound makes such a huge difference when you're playing a game, so I started on that. I went to opengameart.org for a few sounds, but mainly the music, and I went to bfxr.net, which is an awesome free online sound generator, and I generated most of the sounds that I needed there. That specifically is made for retro sounds mostly, but you can make some pretty cool stuff. Doing sound last, I think, has two key advantages. First, I wasn't worried about it at all, and I had time to play the game a bit beforehand, so I had an idea of what sounds I was looking for. Second, it got my mind off of gameplay and added a lot more clarity when I came back to it afterwards. So after all the levels were designed and the sound was in, I play tested every level and tweaked each one for about a good hour individually. I then had my girlfriend play test it live on Skype for me and I watched her play. I always get way more info from live play tests than I get from my own, and if you have other people play your game, I highly suggest that you watch them play it from start to finish without telling them anything. You'll learn a ton. For example, the first thing Nicole did when she got in the game and she was supposed to go right, she went left. She went off the cliff and broke the entire game. Seriously, that was the first thing she did was break my entire game. But that was super useful and I fixed it right away. And also, checkpoints in the game were her idea. She kept dying earlier than I did and she would have to replay the whole level and it was super frustrating. So I implemented those on the spot in about 20 minutes. 
I also tweaked the placement of the code bug enemies after watching her play because it was clear that there were better places for it. And finally, once all of that was done, with 30 minutes to go before the deadline, I threw in a credit section, giving credit to a few of the people whose assets I used off of the open game art and adding a little bit more humor to the end. It was a hell of a weekend, but I had a ton of fun. I highly recommend that anyone that hasn't done a game jam yet, do one. And if you've done a few, push yourself a little more and see what you can come up with. So that's it for this video. Once again, my name is Tim Ruswick, and thanks for hanging out in the underground. I'll see you in the next video.